Okay, welcome back to our Chapter 8 Physics video series. And when we left off in the last video, we were looking at Example 8.6 from the textbook. And this involves angular acceleration of a centrifuge. And we're told that we're going to start uh, from rest, and we're going to power up the centrifuge, and is going to work its way up to an angular velocity of 20,000 RPMs. So as I alluded to earlier, RPMs are a common unit for describing uh, the angular velocity of an engine or a record player, or in this case, a centrifuge, or really any kind of mechanical device that spins. And, but this is not the units, uh, these are not the units we want to use when plugging these values into, um, into one of our formulas. So the very first thing we should do in solving this problem is to take this 20,000 RPMs and convert it into radians per second is what we're going to want. So let's start there. So I'm going to take our 20,000 revolutions per minute is what an RPM is. And we're going to convert, let's convert the revolutions. One revolution is two pi radians. And then we also want to convert our minutes for every one minute. There are 60 seconds. So the revolutions will cancel out. Um, the minutes will cancel out. And I'll be left with radians per second, uh, rads per second, which is what we want. And the uh, 20,000 times 2 pi divided by 60 is 2,000. 100 radians per second. Um, let's now look at our definition of angular acceleration. Angular acceleration is delta omega over delta t, or omega 2 minus omega 1 over delta t. And so um, our omega 2, our, our final um, velocity is our 2100 radians per second minus the initial um, angular velocity was zero divided by time was 30 seconds and I should take a moment here to say that uh, although this value right here actually when you calculate it is uh, 20 or 2094. Uh, this is rounding it off to two significant figures. Um, let me take a look at the original problem statement here. Um, okay, so again, the units given to us 30 seconds. It could be argued that that's only meant to be one significant figure, but I believe the author's intention is for it to be two. Uh, and again, with the 20,000, I think all those zeros are meant to be significant. So this is the limiting term right here to, for two significant figures. So that's why that was rounded off to 2,100. So 2,100 uh, divided by 30 gives us 70 radians per second squared is our angular acceleration. So that answers part A of the problem. And part B wants to know uh, how many revolutions did it go through. So we have constant acceleration. We're going to need to use one of our constant acceleration equations to figure this out. So if I skip back here to this slide that has our constant acceleration equations. Um, we know our final velocity. We know our initial velocity. Um, we know acceleration and time. So we know everything in this equation. So that's not going to really help us out. Um, and what we're looking for is how many rotations. We, we want to know theta. 
So that equation has theta in it, that equation has theta, and that's it. So it's going to be one of these two. We need to narrow it down to one of these two. Um, and we know final, we know initial, we know acceleration, so we could use this one. Um, over here, we know initial, we know the amount of time, and we know acceleration. Yeah, we could use this one as well. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna use this one, but I'm trying to think uh, to explain why we wouldn't use this second one. So actually, I I paused the video here and tried solving uh, the problem using this other equation here, and you know what? Either one of them will work. They both work. They both give you the same final results. Really, we could use either one of these. Um, so I'll, I'll um, use the method that is consistent with the what's in uh, the PowerPoint I have posted to Blackboard, and that is to use uh, this equation right here. I think the reason the author probably chose this one is because it's already set up to be theta equals everything else on the other side of the equation. Theta, since that's what we're looking for, um, it might require a little less algebraic manipulation. This one's already set up um, for theta. So we can set that up here. Theta is equal to our initial velocity times time plus one half acceleration times time squared. So the initial velocity was zero started from rest. So we just have one half times our acceleration, which we calculated here to be 70 radians per second squared. I'm going to square that and then multiply it by time. And uh, we were told in the problem statement that, that time was 30 seconds. Um, oops, this isn't squared. My mistake. This is squared. So one half alpha times time squared, and um, that should give us thirty-one thousand five hundred radians. So we're using radians here uh, in these formulas, and that gives us this answer. But it, as I've said earlier, radians is kind of a hard unit to visualize. Um, when we're talking about mechanical equipment, we usually want to talk about revolutions or RPMs or maybe even degrees if we're talking about a, a relatively small theta. But in, since in this case it's, it's multiple revolutions, degrees won't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and we're not talking about velocity, so we don't need RPMs. We just want to know the number of revolutions. So we need to convert our 31,500 radians by multiplying it for every one radian. Um, no, let's say for every pi radian, that's 180. Uh, no, we don't want to convert it in degrees, what am I thinking? Let's try for every two pi radians, that's one revolution. So we just take our uh, 31,500 divided by 2 pi, and that gives us 5,000 revolutions. Now, we want to be a little bit more careful with our significant figures than the, the textbook author is at times. Uh, we want to say two of them are significant. The other two are not. So 5.0 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, third power, that's how many revolutions the, the centrifuge underwent in this 30 second period. Okay, let's move on to some other uh, 
instances where we can apply this angular motion concept uh, to solve some other types of problems. Um, one of which is rolling motion. So rolling without slipping. So assuming that there's no slipping going on between the wheel and the surface here, there is a direct relationship between the horizontal linear velocity of this wheel, how, how quickly, uh, assuming this wheel is attached to a bicycle, it looks like a bicycle wheel, so how uh, fast along the ground the bicycle is traveling versus the speed at which the, the wheel is rotating. Um, I did not draw a very good uh, semicircle there, but you get the idea how quickly it's rotating. So um, that relationship comes from the relationship between linear velocity and angular velocity, V equals RW. So we've already established this. We're just kind of looking at it in a uh, slightly new context. And uh, the image here is showing us how we can think of the, the point on the edge of the wheel um, moving. What is its linear velocity at any given point in time versus the angular velocity. And that is uh, V equals R omega. All right, we're going to take a, a slightly uh, divergent path now to talk about torque. So torque is related to rotational motion. Uh, we can generate torque by rotating objects. Um, or we can rotate objects by applying a torque to it. And uh, torque is basically um, a turning force, a force that when applied will cause an object to turn or rotate. And so in, in this example, we're looking like in a floor plan view down on a door. And this door might require a certain amount of torque to open it. Um, if you try to do this yourself, if you try to push against a heavy door close to the hinge, you're going to find that you need to apply a much greater force in order to get this door to open than you would had you pushed all the way out here. In fact, that's why they put the doorknob all the way out at the end, because torque is equal to force times a distance, or maybe in this case we we'll use R for radius. So F times R will give us torque. Uh, the amount of torque required to open the door is uh, a constant. So if we um, use a small radius, we're going to need to apply a big force in order uh, for those to generate the same amount of torque. Versus in situation A over here, if we have if we have a very big radius, then we can get away with a smaller force. So um, using a larger radius requires a lesser force. Um, and that's an example of mechanical advantage. So if you think about tools like wrenches, the reason why they have these big, long handles is because the longer the handle, the less force is required to generate the same amount of torque. Torque is equal to F times R. So if we have a nice long R, then our force doesn't need to be as big. Now, an important thing about calculating torque is that the force that is being applied uh, needs to be perpendicular to a line drawn from the point of rotation to where that force is being applied the, um, in order to generate that torque. So if we were to push on the doorknob at an angle, this diagonal force has some vertical component, but also some horizontal component. Only the vertical component is going to actually cause the door to open. And if we push along the door this way, uh, with the line of action of our force going through the hinge, 
the door's not going to open at all. That's just not how doors work. So we'll have to pick up in the next video.